Hello and welcome to Insight of Thermology. This is Dr. Amrit welcoming you to another important advanced lecture on diabetic retinopathy. Today we are studying the important role of steroids in diabetic macular edema. Now, if you would have seen my video on the pathophysiology of diabetic retinopathy, you would understand that chronic hyperglycemia will cause a breakdown of the blood retinal barrier. And this happens because of the two main reasons. Number one is a vascular endothelial growth factor. And the other uh, reason is the inflammatory mediators. Now, these inflammatory mediators could be interleukin-6, interleukin-7, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and MCP1. Now, because of these two factors, that is one is inflammatory arm and the other one is a vasogenic arm, what happens is that there will be an increased vascular permeability. Because of that increased vascular permeability, there will be macular edema. Now, when we treat the patient with anti-VEGFs, we are taking care of this side of the pathophysiology. But what about the inflammation? And this is where the steroids will come into role in the management of diabetic macular edema. Now, as I told you, the inflammatory mediators will cause increase in the vascular permeability and they will, uh, because of that, there will be poor barrier function of the vascular endothelial tight junctions. Moreover, there will be upregulation of the interleukin-6, interleukin-8. Because of these, there will be increased leukocyte migration that is called leukostasis. And uh, apart from that, there will be upregulation of the various adhesion molecules. These adhesion molecules can be ICAM, that is intracellular adhesion molecules. So whenever a cell will express the adhesion molecules like ICAM, what happens is that the leukocytes will get attracted to it and will get stuck to this adhesion molecules and therefore thereby release a lot of inflammatory mediators. Okay. Apart from that, there's also an altered expression of the aquaporins in the Muller cells because of which the fluid will be uh, redirected inside the retina and there will be a retinal edema. So it has a special role. The steroids have a much special role in cases of long-standing chronic diabetic macular edema. Now, it has been seen that in long-standing chronic diabetic macular edema, the VEGF levels almost come to normal or they are very low. Moreover, what we have is a higher levels of the inflammatory markers like IL-8, IL-6 and all those which I told you just now. So that is the reason why usually long-standing chronic diabetic macular edema does not adequately, uh, adequately respond to the gold standard anti-VEGF treatment. So how does the steroids help in chronic DME? Steroids, as we know, they will inhibit the prostaglandin and leukotriene synthesis pathway. Now, this arachidonic pathway and leukotriene pathway, these all are very important for the synthesis of the inflammatory mediators. Moreover, the steroids will downregulate all these inflammatory mediators like interleukin-6, interleukin-8. It will prevent the leukocyte from coming to the site of inflammation. Moreover, it will enhance the barrier function of the vascular endothelial cells and it will also downregulate that adhesion molecule. Apart from that, it also downregulates VEGF, that is vascular endothelial growth factor. So, as, as such, you can see that steroids are not just anti-inflammatory, they prevent edema, they are anti-edematous, they prevent apoptosis of the cells, they are anti-apoptotic and they are also anti-angiogenic. Now the question is, so what are the some specific indications of steroids? Okay, there are a lot of complications that also are associated with steroids, a lot of adverse effect, effects associated with steroids and therefore we need to know about certain special indications where we can actually use these steroids. Now steroids in diabetic macular edema are mainly used as a second line option. So what is the first line? The first line is your anti-VEGF agents, okay? So this is used as a second line option in those patients who are not responding to the anti-VEGF treatment and in particularly with persistent diabetic macular edema. It is also suitable, it may be suitable for patients who are pseudophagics or those who are going to have cataract surgery. So in patients who have already underwent cataract surgery in pseudophagic patients or those who are going to anyway undergo a cataract surgery, this side effect will not be of much significance. Moreover, steroids are given in those patients in which anti-VEGFs are an absolute contraindications like those with myocardial infarction and cerebrovascular accidents. So what are some contraindications to the use of steroids in the eye? Steroids are contraindicated in patients who have an active or suspected ocular or periocular infection, in particularly the viral diseases, 
these viral diseases of the cornea, conjunctiva, that means active epithelial herpes simplex keratitis, okay, vaccinia, varicella, or even TB infections and fungal diseases. In such cases, steroids are absolutely contraindicated. Apart from that, as we know that steroids can cause a raised intraocular pressure. In advanced glaucoma, specifically if CDR ratio is about 0 0.8 is to 1 or more, steroids are usually contraindicated. Moreover, if the person has any hypersensitivity reaction to the steroids or to the component of that injection, usually these drugs are to be avoided in such patients. Now, as I told you, one of the indications for using steroids in diabetic macular edema is the presence of persistent diabetic macular edema. Now, the question is, what is meant by this persistent diabetic macular edema? According to the DRCR.net and the Vista and Vivid data, the persistent macular edema was defined as a failure to achieve a central subfield thickness of less than 250 millimeters or at least 10% reduction for a period of more than six months. In this period, the patient would have taken at least four out of six protocol mandated intravitreal anti VEGFs, right? So, the persistent macular diabetic macular edema, in simple words, means that you are treating the patient for more than six months. You have given them approximately uh, at least four injections out of the six approved anti VEGF agents. Despite that, the central subfield thickness on OCT is still more than 250 or there is not even a 10% reduction in the last six months. So such a candidate will be uh, labeled as to have a persistent diabetic macular edema. Now, after knowing about that, uh, the indications, contraindications, the mechanism of action, the question is, so what are our options in steroids for using, uh, to be used in diabetic macular edema? So we have an intravitreal triamcinolone injection. Then we also have an intraocular delivery device which will deliver the triamcinolone into the intravitreal cavity that is called IVASHIN. Then there is intravitreal dexamethasone implant which is called the OZURDEX. Then we have intravitreal flucinolone inserts which is called the Illuvian. Then we have one more flucinolone insert which is called the RETICERT. Now the question is how many of these are affected, effective and what are actually approved for uh, by the FDA to be used in the diabetic macular edema. So let us see. The first drug is the intravitreal triamcinolone injection. Now the triamcinolone is usually can be used at, in a dose of about 1 mg or 4 mg and has to be repeated every 2 to 4 months interval. The side effects as we know as with other steroids is the raised intraocular pressure and cataract development. Now the question is, are there any landmark studies in re reference to the triamcinolone? Yes, there are. The protocol B of the DRCR network, it actually showed that the focal laser led to superior visual equity outcomes at a three years time period relative to either triamcinolone 1 mg or 4 mg. So definitely the protocol B told you that the triamcinolone was not good or was not superior to the focal laser. But still it is being used and the reason is protocol I. The protocol I of PRCR trial, it reported that the intravitreal triamcinolone, if you use along with laser, will have an efficacy similar to that of ranibizumab plus laser in pseudophagic eyes at two years. So the study was the treatment outcome was to be calculated at two years and this was actually comparing ranibizumab plus uh, uh, the uh, prompt laser and deferred laser along with IVTA plus laser. And they noticed that in patients who were not pseudophagic, obviously the ranibizumab was much better. However, there was a special sub subset of patients, the subgroup of patients, which were pseudophagic at the baseline. And these patients were actually having much more effective results uh, to IVTA plus laser uh, compared to those patients who did not have pseudophagia. That means the development of cataract was one side effect which was actually masking the uh, benefits of using triancinolone. Now, what are the various uh, preparations of triamcinolone which are available to us? The IVTA is available in about four preparations. So we have triamcinolone estonide injectable suspension, which comes in a dosage of about 40 milligrams per ml. Then we have another suspension which comes as 80 milligrams per ml. 
Then we also have trimethyl uh, estonide uh, injectable suspensions of 40 mg per ml and 10 mg per ml to be used for intramuscular and intraarticular use. Now, the intramuscular and intraarticular use drugs should actually not be used for intraocular uh, usage because they are full of preservatives. All these formulations are to be used off-label for DME. They are not approved by the FDA to be used for diabetic macular edema. So these pictures show you the various preparations which are available for triamcinolone acetonide. You can see this one is 40 milligrams per ml suspension. This is preservative free and ideally the preservative free should be used for the intraocular intravitreal injection. The Kenalog 40 and uh, you can see that this one here Kenacot is, is, is to be used for intramuscular injections and they usually have preservatives and should not be used in the eye. What about the eye vashin? Eye vashin, as you can see, it's an implant like this. Okay, so eye vashin is sustained drug delivery system. Okay, it, this is a helical shaped uh, design, helical design implant, which is coated with triamcinolone and it contains about 925 micrograms of triamcinolone. It is made up of a non-ferrous metal alloy, okay, which is MP35N. You uh, it is inserted through an incision which is much smaller than 25 gauze and remains anchored to the sclera. The thing about uh, this is that the phase 1 trial was done, the strike trial, in which it was being compared, the dosage was being calculated. However, what happened was in 2008, this uh, the main company which was carrying out this trial, it actually suspended the phase 2B IVASHIN trial. So therefore, this one is not being used right now. The next uh, implant that we have is a dexamethasone implant, which is also called the Orzurdex implant. Okay, so this Orzurdex is about 700 microns, that is 0.7 milligrams, slow release, biodegradable intravitreal implant. Okay, and it is a polylactic co-glycolic acid. So the, it is biodegradable and that substance is this PLGA. Now, this implant will very slowly release the drugs for at least about four to six months just after a single injection. And it was approved by FDA uh, for DME in the late 2014. So definitely this drug is approved. Okay. And it is specifically to be used in patients who have pseudophagic and who have vitrectomized eye. The peak concentration of the drug will be reached in, in the vitreous at about six, second month. And the drug can be used for about two to Sorry, four to six months. The landmark study which actually led to the approval of the dexamethasone implant or also dex was the MEAD study, M-E-A-D. The M-E-A-D stands for Macular Edema Assessment of Implantable Dexamethasone in Diabetes. It was a three-year randomized sham controlled trial of dexamethasone implant in patients with DME. Now, this actually compared both the high doses and the low doses to the sham treatment. That means the high dose was 700 micrograms and the low dose was 350 micrograms. And what did they observe? They observed that the percentage of patients who achieved a more than 15 letter improvement in the best corrected visual equity from baseline was much better in the DEX implant of 0 0.7 milligram one. And that is the reason why uh, this one is being uh, selected and approved by the FDA. This dosage is actually selected 0.7 milligrams. The MEAT study also showed that there was a long-term improvement in vision and macular thickness in patients with DME treated with dexamethasone implant with a mean of about 4 to 5 injections over 3 years. Then we also had one more study called Protocol U. The Protocol U was a short-term evaluation in which they actually uh, took patients who had refractive or persistent diabetic macular edema. And in one arm, they gave patient dexamethasone along with ranibizumab. And in the other arm, the patients were given uh, ranibizumab despite having persistent diabetic macular edema. And what did we observe? It was observed that anatomically, definitely, the combination perform performed much better. As you can see over here, the central subfield thickness, uh, there was a reduction significantly in the combination group. The combination group here means that the patients were given ranibizumab along with dexamethasone implant. And the ranibizumab, a group did not perform much better in terms of the OCT decrease in the thickness. However, when you see the visual equity, both of them were performing almost equally. So what does it tell you? Tell you? It tells us that 
dexamethasone implant was more useful in reducing the OCD macular thickness in, in non-responders. However, it was not so helpful in improving the best corrected visual equity. Now, another implant that we have is the intravitreal flucinolone estonide implant. In this, the one that is approved by FDA is the Illuvian implant. Okay, now it is a much smaller non-biodegradable device that is injected in the office setting to a self-sealing wound with a 25 gauge inserter. This, the dosage is about 0.19 milligrams and it lasts much longer compared to your Ozodex. Ozodex was lasting for about 6 months and this Illuvian is lasting for about 36 months, that is about 3 years. And it releases about 0.2 micrograms on every day basis. It was approved in 2014 in the US and parts of Europe. So it is a cylindrical device like this. It is almost equal to the nib of a pencil. As you can see, it is made up of a non-biodegradable tube of polyamide. It has a non-permeable cap on one end and a permeable membrane of polyvinyl alcohol on the other end. And its matrix will actually consist of that 0.19 milligrams of flucinolone estronide. It is designed in such a way that it will deliver the drug consistently for a period of about 36 months. So three years is a long time. Now, FAME study was a study which actually led to the approval of this Illuvian for the purpose of diabetic macular edema. In the phase three FAME trial, it compared two doses. One was 0.2 micrograms per day and the other one 0.5 micrograms per day in these patients. And finally, this 0.2 micrograms per day was actually approved. The problem with Illuvian is the side effects. It can cause raise in the intraocular pressure to more than 10 mm of Hg and in some patients even more than 30 mm of Hg. If you see the data from the FAME trial, you can see that more than 30 mm of Hg was raised in about 75 patients. And however, if you see most of the patients were managed with topical treatment and a very few about 5% required surgical intervention for the control of intraocular pressure. So what does it tell you? It tells you that Illuvian can be used. However, it has to be used with those who have been previously treated with the course of corticosteroids and who did not have a clinical significant rise in the intraocular pressure. Those who are already steroid responders, it is better to avoid steroid implants in those patients because that can lead to significant uh, rise in the intraocular pressure. What about reticert? Reticert is again a flucinolone estonide implant, 0.59 mg by Bosch and Law. And it has to be implanted, however, surgically through a 3.5 mm incision in the past planner. And it also works for 36 months. Again, the side effects are more and therefore it is not approved for DME. However, it is being used for the posterior uveitis. Now, there are certain biomarkers which will tell you that a certain kind of patient is going to respond much better to the and uh, to the antivegus and a certain subset of patients will respond much better to your anti-inflammatory treatment with steroids so what are these biomarkers now i already have a video on biomarkers in the diabetic retinopathy series so you, you are advised to visit that video first now there are a lot of biomarkers like the presence of baseline subretinal fluid this is a very good biomarker which indicates a good response to these steroids then again disorganization of the inner retinal layer disorganization of the outer retinal layer and various other signs of chronos, uh, chronicity such as the intraretinal cyst which are extending into the outer retina. Apart from that, low choroidal vascular index will also tell you that the patient might respond better to your uh, anti-inflammatory treatment that is the steroids. Hyperreflective dots and foci, they are nothing but the degenerated photoreceptors and they look it's hyperreflective but do not cause much amount of shadowing as compared to the hard exudates. And such patients also have poor response to the anti-VEGF and they respond much better to your corticosteroids. So that's all for today. Thank you and have a nice day.